Alec and Zooey Morrison have been trying to have a baby for a while now. The doctor tells them nothing showed up in their blood tests, so it's hard to explain what's going on. They talk about in vitro, but it's too expensive. So Zoe goes home with a little brochure of a certain land home for foster children. Alec is not too happy about the idea, but he agrees to think about it. Mrs. Lange is happy to help the couple, but she has a few questions. There was a space left blank in the Morrison's form, where they were supposed to say whether or not they already have children. Zoe tells Mrs. Lange that things have been difficult since the accident. That's actually a genius move, because what are you going to say to that? Taking the tour through the foster home, Zoe sees a little boy in strange clothes smiling at her. Mrs. Lange is talking about the kids' routine and daily activities. She asks what they do for a living, and we learn they're both business owners. Alec inherited a toy company from his dad, and Zoe has a small bookstore for kids. Leaving Lange home, Alec says the visit wasn't so bad, but Zoe can't be fooled so easily. At her bookstore, her mother Diane reads a story to a group of kids, and then reveals that Zoe is the author. She looks embarrassed and clearly avoids interacting with the children. At home, the poster on her wall looks more like a joke, as she is so obviously not living the dream at all. But that may be about to change, because there's someone at the door. It's the little boy in a suit. He says his name is Eli, and he's her son now. Shoving a bunch of papers into her hands, he says the adoption was successfully completed in record time, which can only mean the Morrisons made a great impression. Then he asks for some milk and wants her to change from the cartoons to CNN. Completely baffled by this weird boy, she calls Alec at work. Eli is sleeping when he gets home. Zoe says she called Lange home and left a message, but no one has called her back yet. They drive to Lange home, only to learn that Mrs. Lange has fallen ill all of a sudden. Her assistant, Jane, is very confused and not really able to help. All she can say is that the paperwork checks out and that she'll talk to her boss as soon as she recovers. The couple has no choice but to take the boy in. On their way home, Alec looks upset with such a sudden change. Eli tries to cheer them up with a song and Zoe can't help but smile at the boy's unshakable joy. Later on, she looks inside his suitcase and it's all suits and ties. The boy is seven years old, but he looks like a salesman from the 50s who got miniaturized during time travel. Even his vocabulary is bizarre, as we see when he comes out of the bathroom complaining about the lack of proper dental hygiene products. When he goes to the bookcase and picks up War and Peace, Zooey thinks that's too much and reads him a bedtime story instead. They both end up sleeping on a blanket on the floor. By the time they wake up, Alec has already left to work, much earlier than usual. But he's not actually at work. He's having an unpleasant talk about his debt and the possibility of foreclosure on his mortgage. When he does arrive at work, things are not much better. An employee named Tom comes to talk to him about their wages. He's been working at the factory since Alec's dad started the company 50 years ago. This is the first time he hasn't been paid. Alec blames it all on the recession and promises that things will get better. But as Tom goes to talk to the other workers, he looks very worried and ashamed. At their home, Eli asks Zooey about one of the doors in the house. She tells him it's a bedroom and that nobody can go in there. Maybe one day, but not now. They go for a walk and a homeless guy comes to have a chat. Zooey is uncomfortable and tries to leave, but the man is persistent. He talks to Eli about the fairies that live in those gardens and then asks for some change. Then he looks at her and says, May 15th, 2007. She looks shocked to hear that and wants to know how he knows about that day. He says he's been living in the area for a while and he has seen the family around. At the bookstore, Z introduces Ellie to her mother and she's delighted at the charming manners of the little gentleman. But then Alec calls her in a panic and they must leave at once. They arrive at the factory and see the workers are leaving. Alec explains what happened and complains about his luck. There is no way for a toy factory to compete with the giants anymore. The company is drowning in debt, and his dad would be so ashamed to see everything he had built for many decades get ruined by Alec in two years. Eli interrupts them to complain that the toy helicopter only goes up and down. Alec chooses to ignore this meaningful feedback to continue with the wailing. Zooey's very supportive until she learns about the mortgage. She can't believe he went behind her back and jeopardized their home like that. Later that day, she tries to talk to Eli about starting school tomorrow but he wants to discuss her marriage. He says talking to a stranger might help sometimes. She says he's not a stranger, but she knows what he means. 
The truth is, she can't remember the last time they had any fun together, and that's very sad. At school, it's evident that Eli is the different kid, and he just couldn't care less. He just waits for recess and then takes a taxi to the toy factory. Just like that, Alec is surprised to see him there, asking questions about the company and making comments on the recession. Getting home, Zooey is upset at the little stunt, but this little boy is smarter than they could have imagined, and he has correctly predicted how hungry they would all be at this time. A perfectly timed Chinese food delivery is more than enough to cheer them up. But when Zooey sees Eli playing with a teddy bear, she gets distressed. He says he took it from the forbidden bedroom. Taking the toy from him, she tells him to never go in there again. Now, she didn't say anything about leaving the house in the middle of the night in his pajamas, did she? Off he goes into the park where Mr. Potts is comfortably sleeping on a bench. He almost has a heart attack when Eli wakes him up asking him about his life. Potts says it could be better and the boy tells him to look at the bright side. At least he doesn't have to go to school every day. Potts then asks him about his new parents and he says they're a lovely couple. On the next day, a Mr. John Burns visits Alec at work. He wants to talk about the product lines. With the recession, it's starting to become expensive to invest in old-fashioned toys. Alec begs him to reconsider and appeals to their friendship, but Burns says this is business. Feeling defeated, Alec goes to visit his father's grave. Mr. Potts comes out of nowhere, and now it's Alec's turn to almost have a heart attack. Potts apologizes and they start talking. He shows Alec a few roses that were growing from beneath an abandoned tombstone. Nobody would have thought something so charming would come out of such a place. That seems to inspire Alec a little bit, so he stops by the bookstore with a peace offering. He has decided he should spend more time with Eli. And that, of course, is all the boy wanted. Soon, that helicopter is dramatically improved and flying in all directions. Eli asks about the Legoland poster on the wall, and Alec says he never had time to go there. One day, maybe. He takes Eli to the storage room where the wooden toys are sadly waiting on the shelves. They used to be very popular, but now no one cares about them. Everyone wants electronic toys and stuff like that. Eli says that's all garbage that ends up breaking down soon. Alec agrees with everything the boy says. It's like his own mind took the form of a mini human so they could have a conversation. But then Eli says they should go out more and do something together as a family. Alec goes back to his cold dad mode and says he has too much on his plate right now. Eli understands, and as a prize, he gets to keep one of the Russian dolls. A few days later, he tells Zooey that they're picking up Alec at work. Napping on his desk and suddenly woken by Eli, Alec must be getting used to the heart attacks by now. Eli tells him to hurry because they have a lot to do. He tries to explain how busy he is at the moment, but that's hard to believe when he's just been caught sleeping. Zooey realizes that Alec had no idea about any of this, but the boy simply says they must get going to avoid traffic. Narrating the GPS coordinates from the back seat, Eli also says they should look at this as an inspirational trip. Alec is in the toy business and should get to know more about his clients. With a depressive sigh, Alec says his inspiration has vanished many years ago and he's nothing but an empty well now. Eli says nonsense. This is nothing but a dry spell, but the rain will come soon. Before Alec can reply to that with more doom and gloom, they realize where they're going. It's Legoland, of course, because you can't have all this emotional healing without some product placement, right? Still firmly resisting fun, Alec says Eli can go to the rides by himself, but the boy reminds him that he's only seven after all and he must be accompanied by an adult. Alec's ride partner points out that he's too big for that wagon. He says he knows, but no one listens to him. That attitude slowly changes during the day as they have lots of fun together. Alec even wants his own toy license printed out, much to the dismay of the employee in charge. Washing down all this fun with some ice cream, Zooey and Alec are surprised at themselves. Zooey even says that for a moment, she's forgotten all about that forbidden bedroom back home. And just when they thought it was over, Eli had one more surprise for them. Roller skating was one of the first things they'd done together when they first met. And now, they're about to recreate that moment. Very confident that he never lost his skill, Alec sounds like a completely different person, and nobody would say that only this morning he was comparing himself to an empty well. Even when reality interferes with his imagined skating skills, he can just laugh at himself and enjoy the moment with his wife. At night, Eli asks for a bedtime story again, 
but this time it's Alec who's reading and making all the voices. Once the boy has been tucked in, he talks to Zooey and tries to apologize again, but there's no need. For the first time ever, Eli gets to see them kiss as he sneaks out of bed. And it seems like this little guy never runs out of surprises. Zooey is astonished to find out the gentle music that woke them up is coming from the piano. She says Alec was going to teach their son how to play. Eli sounds surprised to hear about this other son. Now it's time to open up for real. Going through an old photo album, she tells him about Samuel, who would be the same age as Eli today. Holding back tears, she talks about his first soccer match and his favorite ice cream flavor. He was their angel and the light in their life. Behind the forbidden door, his bedroom is still intact. Eli asks what happened. Two years ago, they were coming back home from a soccer match and there was a terrible accident. A car ran over Samuel as he chased a ball. Zooey and Alec have never been the same. Alec is listening to her from the staircase and he hears her saying that it was all her fault. They take Eli to visit Samuel's grave and Alec breaks down in tears. He says there's a giant hole in his heart that feels impossible to heal. When they're back home, Zooey suggests they clean up the bedroom and Alec agrees. At night, he follows the fireflies into the park and Mr. Potts is there. He says these are the fairies he's always talking about. Recognizing him from the cemetery, Alec introduces himself properly this time. They start talking about the toy business and Potts says sometimes it helps to talk to a stranger. I wonder where he got this idea from. When asked about his religious beliefs, Alec says he can't believe in a God that ends a life. Potts says the problem with human beings is that we never seem to live in the moment. We're always dwelling in the past or worrying about the future. During dinner with Diane, Eli asks them if they met Mr. Potts who lives in the gardens. Alec says he's an odd fellow, not unlike the present company. Then he looks at the Russian dolls and suddenly has an idea. He tells Eli that he's a genius and the boy promptly agrees. Alec gets to the office and starts sketching. Each design goes through Eli, and to no one's surprise, he is a harsh critic. But that's exactly what keeps Alec trying harder until he actually gets it right. Finally, those thumbs go up, and it's time for the production phase. A few phone calls later, Eli and Alec have a presentation to deliver. Even poor old Tom agrees to join their efforts. A panel of old guys in suits do not intimidate this brave boy. Apologizing for Alec's absence, Eli introduces himself as his representative. Joe Burns says he has pants older than Eli, who replies that might be too much information. Then Tom walks in with the new product. It's the mystery box containing five different toys. When Burns asks him which one, Eli says he can't answer that or it wouldn't be a mystery anymore. But then how would the customers know what they're buying? That one is answered by one of his colleagues. The customer will not know because that's what they're buying, the mystery itself. A Japanese man places a huge order right away and the others follow after. Burns still looks unconvinced but doesn't want to fall behind. Everybody wants the mystery box. That calls for a celebration and all three of them go jumping up and down quite literally. Playing ball with Eli, Alex surprises Zooey when he asks him to call him dad. That's the kind of thing you tell a friend, right? So that's what Eli does. Once again, waking up poor Mr. Potts in the middle of the night. Potts is glad to hear the good news and says there's one more thing Eli should do. By now, the Morrisons already know there's no use in arguing with the little tyrant. So, next morning, they all come marching to Mr. Potts and Alec invites him over for Christmas. And speaking of Christmas, the mystery box is a huge hit in every store. Kids are just crazy about it. The best thing for Alec is that he only has to make the boxes and fill them up with the old junk no one wanted before. Nothing like a clever package. It's truly a Merry Christmas at the Morrisons tonight. Mr. Potts gets to have a shower and Alec has lots of fun trying to guess his presents with Eli. When Potts is leaving, Zooey gives him some money. He tries to decline, but she says he was once someone's little boy before things took a turn for the worse. It could have been her own son living in the streets. Before going to bed, Eli asks Zooey if she believes in angels. He tells her it's nice to think that someone is watching over you. She doesn't give him a straight answer, but that's because she has a lot on her mind. She's about to give Alec a gift he could never have guessed. A pregnancy test she's already taken. On Christmas morning, they're very excited to tell Eli about the baby. That's when Jane calls from Lange home, 
saying that Mrs. Lange is all better now and there's an urgent matter they must discuss. Those papers they left with Jane refer to a child that never existed. Upstairs, all Alec finds in Eli's bed is an envelope. Not even his photograph with the Lego driving license is there anymore. Now, Zooey can see what happened. Eli was never a real boy and neither was Mr. Potts. In his letter, Eli thanks them for their kindness and wishes them a happy life. He even has a little spoiler for them. It's a girl. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 2011 movie, Foster, by Starlight Films, starring Tony Collette and Richard Grant. So, what about you? Do you believe in angels? And more importantly, would you buy a box just for the mystery? Let us know in the comments below with hashtag CinemaRecap. Until next time.